The world doesn't think that the gospel can change your life, but we know that it can. And that's why we want you to hear these stories, stories of transformation, stories of freedom, people getting free from sin and healed from sin because of Jesus. This is Death to Life. I put a big hole in the wall. I picked up the lawnmower and I threw it through another wall. And then when they heard a loud crash, they stopped fighting and opened the garage door and saw what I was doing. And I yelled at them that they needed to grow up. Um, all this fighting, all this, like, I just, I, it was me like yelling painfully and just trying to like get them to think that I'm going crazy or something, right? Yeah. And then they, my mom recognized it right away. She yelled, like, he doesn't do this. We are damaging him. Yo, 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 yo. What is good? Welcome to the Death to Life podcast. My name is Richard Young. And today's episode is with my bro, my guy, Joshua Bonifacio. Uh, This guy has a beautiful heart. There is some trauma in his story. There's some heartbreaking stuff. But God has made a way and has revealed himself to Joshua in such a beautiful way. Um, yeah, some of this stuff is is dark, but um, when it's real dark, that means the light shines much brighter. So uh, buckle up, strap in. This is Joshua. Love y'all. Appreciate y'all. All right, my man, where are we starting? Where are you taking us to? Where does the journey of Mr. Bonifacio, where does it begin? Oh man, I was born to two immigrant parents who moved to America to give me a better life and was not prepared for what would actually happen <laughs> uh, once they got here. And that and they were they are both believers in Jesus, but also did not really know the gospel. So you got a lot of cross-generational trauma that's passed over trying to find that balance and what it means for having a kid in a land that you don't speak the language of. So, I mean, (laughs) where did they immigrate from (laughs) the Philippines, the Philippines, and you were born in the Philippines or you were born here? I was born here. They came here. I want to say 90, 92, I want to say, and then, and 91, 92, I want to say 92. And then they had me the next year. So I'm a 93 baby. You're 10 years younger than me. What part of the country did they they immigrate to? Was it the Northwest or somewhere else? Northwest. They came out in Oregon. Wow. So they were believers, but didn't know how life kind of worked out here. And it was tough going. What happened? Yeah. So my, my dad's side is Jehovah's Witness. And then my mom's side is Catholic. And they also didn't really connect with legalism of it all because both sides are very legalistic. And there's also an unsaid thing that happens in the Filipino culture where they go to the church for the social circles, mm-hmm. right? And to show face, but they don't, some, my family in particular and surrounding social circles didn't really connect with the gospel itself. They were very focused on, we are sinners. We have to redeem ourselves every day, every second. And then Jehovah's Witness side was like, they were also very legalistic. And my my experience with that on my dad's side was, was like, this is not the same as what, yes, there is Jesus, but he was like on a stake. There was no cross. He was like, they were, it was just constant little bits and changes that they didn't believe that was like the same to other, of other Christian faiths. So, I don't know too much about the Jehovah's Witnesses, Hmm. except that they came out in the the late or the early 19th century and they pretty strict, like no birthdays and stuff like that. Did you? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Sorry. When you, that hot laugh is a, is a trauma hit. (laughs) Oh, sorry, dude. (laughs) When's your birthday? We need to celebrate with you. (laughs) No, here you go. This is why that laugh came out. My birthday is December 26th. Oh, wow. And so it's the day after Christmas. And then my dad's side was not very big on holidays or birthdays. And then I'm back to back. Wow. So, yeah. So there was, there would be like on my dad's side, it would be, God, I'm not supposed to, I'm like growing up as a kid. I'm not supposed to celebrate, not do anything. At least it felt that way. And then my mom, as soon as I leave my, cause my parents got divorced. So I'm going back between them every two weeks. So there's no downtime between, right? So mm-hmm. dad's side would be like quiet. 
like not much, like no celebration. And then on my mom's side, Merry Christmas, happy birthday. And then, oh, sh- <laughs> oh hold on, wait, I'll stop. My dad's outside the door. <laughs> we'll, they'll let them walk away first and then, and then let me gradually warm up to it. Who, who is stricter in their beliefs? Between my parents or like the family yeah, circles? Your parents. Between my parents. Here's the thing is that my mom and my dad both felt something was off. And hmm. so they would teach me like stories and talk about it a little bit. But when it came to actually practicing it, it, it wasn't really there. So it would be mostly the aunties and uncles and grandparents, which Filipinos are like really tight knit. So I would see them all the time. They were the ones who like really, it was mainly like grandparents. And and then my dad's side, what I think was uh, heavier on the legalism of it. Wow. So you come into the world do you remember your parents being together or for the most part you that was pretty much separate pretty much separate and having their own issues so i was forced to grow up pretty quickly yeah tell me about that my my dad had his own problems with what it means to be a man in this country and how to pass it on and be a good father to his son and i could sense a lot of pressure happening with him but as a kid you don't really know what to do they just know that something's up and then, and that kind of the similar stance on my mom's side, it wasn't maybe until my, like my mid twenties when I started really connecting the dots on why my parents were the way they were having to come over here, putting sacrifice in a ton of stuff. And then, and you're supposed to be with your life partner. And then now you're not, and just all, the pressure of having this fast growing kid who is loud and all over the place and jumping everywhere and asking questions, my my parents really, really dug in deep and tried to do their best, but I could, they hurt, they were hurting a lot. Hmm. They were hurting a lot. Yeah. What kind of values do you feel like you picked up from like the Filipino culture that you grew up in from both families, but, or both sides, not together? What kind of values do you think were instilled? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Community and family was probably is, I'm not gonna say was probably, but it actually is the number one state, like staple that was embedded in me from an early age, the whole, even like the little things they do where even if they're not blood rel- relatives, they would be my auntie and uncle somehow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is auntie Craig Johnson. <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, cool. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. I am five years old and I think you are my relative <laughs> <laughs> and, and sharing plates of food with them all the time. Always asking if you're hungry to make sure you're full, even though you've had your fourth, third, plate of lumpia and rice and everything. And they're always asking if you want to take food home. We overcooked, we have all this stuff, we have get togethers and just being socially around other people all the way into the night. It was almost, it was really crazy. All these older people and just a variety of ages constantly being with each other and eating and talking and socializing. That's something that was embedded into me very young. I then became the kid who would run around in the apartment complex, knocking on all the doors, asking if the friends could come out and try to get people together to the point where the parents knew it was me. They didn't even check the door. And he was like, hey, Josh, <laughs> before they even like, before they even looked through the eye hole. Okay, Kayla can't come out to play right now, but she can in an hour. I'm like, okay, sir. And then I'll just run off and run and knock the next door. So I, I took that on at a really a young stage in my life. So as you're growing up, I mean... What happened, man? You're living mostly with your mom? Is that a trauma laugh? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> We're going to mark them through the video. <laughs> All right. What happened in your life? <laughs> yeah, a lot of trauma. We uh, So I'll just fast forward a little bit. My mom met a guy who she had my lovely brother and sister with, Andrea and Andrew, and we moved down to Georgia. We lived off a of Marine base, and that took me away from all of the social circles that I had, familial and friendly. So I didn't get to see my family and friends a whole lot. It was just just ripped from my life. But then I was able to build a new community down in Georgia, which I still connect with because we lived in a small town called Leesburg, Georgia. And it was a wonderful place. It still is a wonderful place, but I didn't have any family. We also did not go to church at all. So God was also ripped away from my life too. And so I was left in, I felt like I was walking. I keep thinking about walking through the wilderness and just like trying to figure it out. And it, it's the relationship between my mom and this guy deteriorated uh, and also got violent 
It became a, a very violent home, abusive home. We're talking like broken glass everywhere, hitting each other. I went through a very abusive stage there too, where I was, I'm a bigger kid. I was, I had a bigger body and I was more athletic. And so, uh, I could like tank the hits, but it's still like, it's still like it, it embedded like a, a, the trauma and psychological mm. pain of like when pain comes along, I like become like a robot and just shut down and like bet what's next. Cause it just, it would just keep happening. So people are like fight or flight. And I was very much stand and take it kind of guy. Mm -hmm. Where like I don't want to like cry and, or like show that it hurts, but ooh, it hurt. Um, you, was is that freeze? I don't. We try to mm -hmm. pigeonhole everybody. There's fight, flight, yeah. or freeze. You just you just took it like a like a champ. Yeah, like I I would quite literally tank it. So mm -hmm. like as in like the hits would come my way and I would hit it and I wouldn't hit back uh, or try to yell back. I just <laughs> took it and then wait and then cried by myself like in the corner or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some, this is, I don't know if it's gonna be part of recording, but this is the part in the story where we got into it the first time I tried to record with you. And then I was like, Ooh, I was not ready to talk about this. And that's why I had like panic, like an anxiety. Really? Attack. Yeah. So this is where, but I like, I'm better this time around, but that's, this is like the part of the story where it got it. I realized I hadn't talked about it in so long. Oh, wow. And so so it, just it, even talking yeah. about the violence or talking about that aspect. Just the feelings all came back, huh? Yeah, it came back harder than I thought. It was again, it was the psychological trauma of going, of going. Oh, I can take it. It might be more of me being a man, if anything. Going like, oh yeah, no, I can handle it. And then it comes up like, oh wait a second, I, I, I got water coming from my eyes, and yeah, but yeah, like what if yeah. stuff really hurts? What if it, there's really sad things in life? And if we're mm -hmm. men, we're not supposed to believe that they're sad or that these things hurt. You know, that that's like the toxic masculinity that that we can't act like things hurt. But it yeah. hurt, man. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it did. It, it, it's, it becomes uh, almost a muscle memory. I don't like no man ever decided. No one ever decides to go in their head, go, I'm going to be a tos toxic masculine man. Right. It right. just it's things happen and then it becomes pattern because it's not corrected then it usually takes community or someone near you who cares about you to point it out and go, Hey, that's something's wrong. And then you have to come to peace with that and decide if you want to, you know, hit it head on and, and try to figure it out or keep burying it down. I, I buried it down for, for a while. I think that's what we're taught. Right. And yeah. in the light of freedom, it's okay to, it's okay. Not even in the light of freedom. It's okay to feel things because you can't help but feel things. And if we suppress them so that we don't feel like I've said this a ton before, we don't turn down just one feeling. If you're going to turn down feelings, you're turning down all of the feelings. And then you're just walking around as a robot. So after we recorded last time, you realized, oh man, that that's what hit me in that moment. I, I hadn't thought about that for a while. Yeah, I was, I ignored signs of, just, oh man, I, I feel like I'm going to, I'm trying to over explain it and seem like it's really well thought out. It wasn't, it was very simple. It was straight up. Like I thought I could handle it and then realized I hadn't talked about it in, in years. And even the last time I talked about it actually was in my baptism at PBC. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was bawling and I was crying because my mom and my little cousins were there. You guys are here and I am, love you so much. And there was so much pain that was let out. And then I, and then I just shut it down again. Never talked about it until the time we had an interview, until we talked. So that experience, how long did it last down there in Georgia with this guy? Six and a half years, six, seven oh, years. Yeah. So this is right as a child go going up into your teen years or before that? From fourth grade to junior year of high school wow yeah so basically my whole de my developmental yeah years. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely and so you coped with life by just taking it on head on then just like being a tank absorbing yeah being it's just being tough and then smiling and laughing on the outside to like deflect and make a lot of jokes and yeah just being <laughs> A quote unquote, a man about it. Was God a consideration at this point? <laughs> no, <laughs> there was, <laughs> no, it was not. There were glimpses of every now and then we would go to a church, go to a church maybe once every three years, two or three mm -hmm. years. 
towards the end, my mom decided to put us into a church community just to just because I, I think she just felt that she's had enough and saw the, the change happening with me and that I wasn't doing okay. And especially my younger brother and sister who were babies and toddlers this whole time, mind mm -hmm. you. So they were like, they were in the same home that I was. Uh, and the, so we started going to a church, maybe my freshman, sophomore year of high school. And I didn't know anything about church other than the Kingdom Hall, Jehovah's Witness and Catholic Church. And even then I wasn't really tapped into a community as a kid. My parents didn't do that. I don't think they knew how to. But then I found out like they have, it's not just church isn't just mass. Church isn't just the main sermon. Because before that, I always thought it was, oh, you come, you listen to the preacher, and then you leave. And there's nothing else around it. And mm -hmm. then I found out about the, oh, there's youth groups. There's these other like men's meetings and then women's meetings and like all this like Bible studies. I had no idea about that. When I found out there was youth group, being a youth myself at the time, I was elated and also sad because I felt like I missed out on so much mm -hmm. too. Not knowing that there was kids my age who were just hanging out every night or whenever they whenever church would have them and just connecting and growing. And that put, that made me really sad because I compared it. I made myself sadder. I would compare these kids who were having fun and laughing. And I also felt like I had like an imposter syndrome being there laughing with them because at the same time that when I found out about youth group and hanging out with these people and these kids, my age, I, at the same time, any other night before church, it would be me crying in my room and like bruised up. And so it was a huge 180. When we talk about, just when the gospel starts to enter just a little bit into your life, it's so much better. And I had so many mixed feelings and I'm still friends with these people to this day. We're like connecting the small town culture is real. Would you say you were like aloof? Like when you went to these meetings and stuff, were you, cause I met you for the first time in person a couple of weeks ago and you're a big dude. Uh, <laughs> you were probably a big dude back then. Were you just kind of the big dude that's kind of just quiet and, uh, doesn't just nervous? No, I was the opposite. I was, I was the biggest dude in the room. I was the loudest. I was the funniest. And I was, I, a lot of people looked, <laughs> a lot of people wanted to hang out and invited me stuff. And I always came up with an excuse not to go. It would, the, my home life was still pretty much pretty violent and not good. And so I would connect with these people. But I would compartmentalize. This is the, these are the hours I get to have fun. And so I'm going to have as much fun as I can. So I'm going to tell jokes. I'm going to hang out, do like be crazy and have, just run around with people. And then, and then after that, it was no more fun. After hmm. that, it was time to buck up and just get ready for whatever happens that night. Hmm. So you were there up until your junior year. What happened at, at your junior year? All right. This is why I started crying last time, because this is what happened. Um, I became, I'm very self-aware of how my situation was going. My mom was stuck in a trauma cycle and she's been through so much that I see her lost in this cycle of violent, crying, hurt, missing family, not able to go anywhere. At times she would disappear from the house just because of all the violence. And she knows she doesn't want to fight. She's tired of fighting. Mm -hmm. So she would go stay like she was sleeping in her van outside in like the driveway or she would go to a motel or maybe hang out with friends but she would disappear for a while um and then her boy her boyfriend at the time he would start drinking at noon so mm. he would always have the big tall cans of miller light just start chugging and then be drunk before the day before the sun even sets so i would be left alone with him and then my younger brother and sister andrea and andrew who were born one year and one day apart, they got so used to the yelling, the violence, the cursing, the crashing of plates and furniture. They got so used to it that I would see them in the living room still playing and laughing with each other and toys while all the violence was happening in the background because they thought it was normal. Mm. And that was very heartbreaking to see. They're like, oh yeah, mom and dad are just going at it again. This is what happens. And the stepdad, mom's boyfriend at the time, sometimes he would put his hands on me he sometimes he would just curse me out here yeah, or just say, say really uh, horrible stuff or i would he would make me go sleep on the porch or lock me out or whatever it is so all this coming to a head i felt like i needed to do something before my it was the beginning or maybe the summer of my junior year i want to say that 
I've never thrown hands back. I've never reacted. I've always tanked it and, and went back. So I needed, I decided that I needed to do something out of character, but I didn't want to hurt anyone. But I wanted to do something that was like alarming. And the best I could do at the time was I went to the garage and I put a big hole in the wall hmm. while they were fighting. So mom came home and they're having another one of their arguments. I put a big hole in the wall. And I picked up the lawnmower and I threw it through another wall. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the Incredible Hulk style. I, 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 was, I was doing sports too. So, you know, I was, I was also really, I was also big. And then when they heard a loud crash, they stopped fighting and opened the garage door and saw what I was doing. And I yelled at them that they needed to grow up all this fighting, all this. I just, I, it was nothing. It probably sounds way more sophisticated now, way more cinematic. It was not. It was me yelling painfully and just trying to get them to think that I'm going crazy or something, right? Or like see that what they're doing has an effect because my brother and sister have decided that it was normal because they were babies and they didn't know better. And I was like, I'm literally the only catalyst that could do something. Yeah. And then they, my mom recognized it right away. She yelled like, he doesn't do this. He, th we are damaging him. She yelled it like out loud. And then he, the, her boyfriend didn't react to it. And I think that's the kind of what sealed the deal with my mom too, to like officially call it off because she saw her babies like hurting and then the, her boyfriend didn't actually care. Hmm. And then he tried to put his hands on me again. And this time, instead of just taking it, I like resisted and he found out that I was a bit stronger than him in resisting. <laughs> and then that made him feel unsafe. <laughs> so. We, him being feeling unsafe because I decided to resist this time was also another sealed deal to like actually leave, get us out. Like we were not going back. Mom and I lived in a motel, living off the vending machine for maybe a, maybe a month. I'm not really like that part because it's a little bit blacked out, but I want to say about a month. And then we got money to fly ourselves back here to Oregon and, and I would finish high school here. Wow. So, uh, you, you still had family back in Oregon. We did. Yeah. They didn't know how bad it was. Hmm. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't know how bad it was. They, they learned after the fact. When you get back here to Oregon, did things slow down for you? Did you feel safety or talk to me about that? Man, you see an aquarium where you like spray in water or like shuffle up all the rocks in the dust, mm -hmm. right? It has been clean in a while. And then it all starts gently floating down and eventually settles. Mm -hmm. And then you can see the fish and how beautiful it is. Mm -hmm. That's what it was like for maybe in the next until right before COVID. So 2017, 2018, like I mentioned, that's when I met during these time, I, I started going, doing hip hop, like dancing and doing artistic things. I got into the hip hop world and would go to these underground studios, these rented out clubs that I should not be in, <laughs> but somehow I got in and would hang out with all these artists in the city who just come out at night. I met Hui and Bibi in those, in that scene. And I was still in high school. And it was years later when we and BB had Bible studies and invited me to come check it out. And this whole time I've always been, I've been trying to figure out this relationship with God and the gospel. I went to different churches, had really weird experiences, but nothing ever connected. So this is the first time I actually went to a Bible study, like an actual sit down at home Bible study. And it was different. It was connecting, things made sense, and I felt good about it. And I was like, I'm going to come back again. Wait, and, hold on. Through the dancing, what made yeah. you... So you get into hip-hop dancing, mm -hmm. you you graduate high school. What was the plan? That you just like dancing, or what was the plan for your oh, movie? Oh, no, dancing was like an output. So I was... I, I have an artistic output that I need to take care of, so I do a bunch of drawing. But dancing was a bunch of exertion, right? And it was to music that I enjoyed. And I, it was also the very first time I connected with other people who believed in an art craft that would hype each other up and connect with you outside of just the performance or just outside of the building. And because it was hip hop is a culture, yeah, where mm -hmm. it's not just the music. They connect on like the views and what's being said. And sometimes it's healthy, sometimes it's not. But either way, it was connecting. So I was looking for that. Outside of high school, I wanted to do I went to school for film. You went to school for film. That sounds super cool. So you yeah. found like a family with this dance community. I did. I did. And it's funny because they do give you nicknames. So there's almost a small disassociation with having to deal with your trauma and deal with who you are because you can, you're recognized as something else. 
So you can build like a, almost a persona on top of what's actually everything that you live through. What was your name? Uh, I had two. <laughs> one, one was at first it was ATL because I was from Georgia and they're like, oh, Atlanta is the capital of Georgia. Let's go. <laughs> your name, your ATL. Yeah. Um, and then I got a nickname called Aang. I don't know if, but there's a, a cartoon called The Last Airbender, Avatar The Last Airbender. I've, I've heard of it. I haven't seen it. Yeah. So the main character, his name's Aang, and he's like this bubbly dude who is just happy all the time and wants to be with his friends and he can get serious. But most of the time he tries to be happy and also just lighthearted. Mm -hmm. Also, he's pretty much buzz cut, like shaved. And I was rocking a buzz cut all day, like every day when I'm <laughs> at this time. So you were Aang or, the, or ATL. Yeah. What was like that life in that dance community? Like I've done mm -hmm. now three, no, maybe four interviews with people from this specific dance community yeah. uh, on the Desert Life <laughs> podcast. What was the negative things about the community that were confusing or tough to deal with or mixed messages? Yeah. you. So it's like surface level validation uh, at first where you get this, you get cool nicknames. You there's like fashion stuff that happen, right. And where you like, you dress cool. People really love it. You get validated for basically confidence and doing really outstanding things that show that you are a great, unique individual and that we love it. And there's a lot of, a lot of love for the individual and for yourself. And then there's a lot of hate that comes out when some of that is challenged. This for me in particular allowed me to, again, I was going through the same mindset from when I was in Georgia, where this is the amount of hours I have to have fun. And then out of that, I got to go back to doing life and just trying to back back that I have all these triggers and my PTSD would come through during these hours and have to deal with it. But there is a dis disassociation and disconnect where I wasn't really getting better. Hmm. I wasn't actually getting healthier. I wasn't actually getting happier. I had an escape and it felt very unhealthy and material. Very, it felt very plastic, especially when you see some of the older people who've been around in the scene and they've, they're still struggling with the same stuff. And they have, there's no improve improvement. And then you see some of that where there just been, there's a lot of suffering and you, uh, over the years where people your age or even older than you are still going through the same thing. And you just have to think to yourself, there's gotta be more than this. I don't want to, I don't want to be 60, 70 years old, walking through the streets, always going to this meeting with wondering like what happened to all the young folk. And then I'm so grumpy and like mad about my own existence. Yeah. Community is powerful in that way. Cause it can bond you even in a negative thing. But to, to love and be loved, man, we're just, we're built for it. And so we search for it, looking for mm -hmm. it. And then you, we might end up looking in the wrong place, but from this community. So Hui and Bibi, when you met them, they were obviously, or you tell me, were they vibing with God at all? Or were they just like the coolest kids or just a part of this community? So Bibi has always been a sweetheart to me. Bibi and I have always connected on the same page where we see each other and we have big smiles. So good to see you. And it's like actually having a, a, a very positive aura. Mm -hmm. I knew Hui before he came to Jesus, I would say, and where he was still in his old, in his like Red Bull, like DJ kind of days, mm -hmm. like the, like chasing the dollar. And at that time we just knew each other by name. And it was very casual, but we didn't really connect other than just seeing each other at the same kind of stuff or going to his event that he would host. And he would host some really like banger events, like a ton of people would come out. Like he would shut down blocks and mm. yeah. And it would be, people were so thankful for it. And I, so I've been to a number of these things with him and I was, this was very much, I felt was like more is better. More is better. Everyone's here. There's so many people of different varying cultures and like coming out and partying and having a good time. And then it was like blackout where I was like, I'm not really, I'm not happy. And I want to, and I'm getting this call from, I don't know what it was at the time, but it was definitely the Holy Spirit in hindsight that's telling me like, you need to come to church. You need to come connect and figure this out because you've been thinking about this way too long and putting it off. And then we post on Facebook, you want to, <laughs> who wants to come to a Bible study, like years later, out of nowhere, I'm like, whoa, okay. Yeah. 
that would be dope. What is and I'm like, this could be like a hip hop Bible study. It's gonna be like a. <laughs> it's gonna be like a DJ. Hip hop Bible study. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And so like, I, I walk Jesus in. Loves you. Mm, 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 I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it, Had it been a while since you'd seen Hui? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I, I disconnected from that community. I actually had an interesting conversation these past couple of weeks with Pastor Kessia Rain. Uh-huh. And it's been amazing to really hear her talk because I found out that I had a pattern. Again, this is the amount of hours I get to have fun. These are the hours I have to buck up and be a man. Mm-hmm. That translated to, I'm going to be with this community for a while, connect, and then I'm going to leave them and then go find a new community because I didn't have stabilization in my life. I didn't know what it meant to be consistent, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was. she's amazing. I, I found that that was one of the really great highlights of talking with her. With Hui and them, yeah, I disconnected from the dance community and then that came through and I show up and it's just a few people. It's me, Hui, Bibi, I think Lindsay. Lindsay, the roommate who is also a great friend of ours, was there. And yeah, it was, that was us. And I think there was, they had, oh, and then they had a roommate, Dante, who was like later there, also part of it. And then we had some friends come through. But either way, it was a smaller group of people, but it felt like it was the whole world in one living room. And that was, it was the only room that like mattered to me at the time. Do you remember what he started talking about? Hui? Yeah. In, in, uh, in the Bible? Like study? it. The very first Bible, I, the only one that I clearly remember was the night I found Jesus. That's the one I clearly remember. The Talk to me about that one. The other ones are cool. Yeah. So <laughs> it was out in the Pleasant Valley slash Happy Valley here in Oregon, which is South Portland, South Portland metropolitan area. And they had this apartment. And the really cool thing about this apartment is that the dancers that they are, the living room, they push the couches over to the sides of the wall. So it's just open carpet. So you could mm-hmm. just lay out and do and just be silly or whatever. So. It was towards the end of the night and our homeboy Dante was there and BB and Hui were there. And I think Lindsay was there, but I think her her and someone else was like, she was like talking with someone in the room or something. Anyways, it was, Hui was on the couch and then I lay down on the floor and I just had like my jacket on me. And then Hui just started reading the Bible. He just started reading and quoting some stuff and I'm laying there and I felt like a, a, a light joyful nuclear explosion right in the dead center of my sternum that spread out and then like it went from my body and went through my limbs and then came out and settled right behind my eyes Hmm. and right behind my eyes uh, that nuclear explosion the wave came out as tears Hmm. and just started pushing and i'm like what is going on what is (laughs) happening why am i feeling this way i was just laying here I turned into an 80 year old man <laughs> and I was just laid down and he was questioning his existence. And then Hui, Ooh, Hui is so fun. Like he, when he sees the Holy spirit, like ignite, yeah, yeah. he goes into, he goes into full on pursuit mode. He turns into Vin Diesel from the fast and furious where he's <laughs> jumping from the car over to where you're sitting. He's like, Oh, what's going on? Oh, and it's like another one for family. And he's just, he starts going in. <laughs> and, and I always say that at the, the time I was like, felt like if I ever did find Jesus, it would be the clouds would open up and trombones would be playing and spotlight would come out and Jesus, hello, son. But not, it was none of that. It was ugly. I was crying. I had snot come out my nose. I was trying to hide my face behind my jacket. I was just, I was, I didn't know the tear, if the tears would stop, but it felt good. It felt what, good because it was different. What was the main idea crime. that was pushing this emotion? That Jesus was real, like actually real. It felt, I kept, like the closest metaphor at the time when they were asking me that night and I was already drained was like, it felt like knowing the sky was blue and always seeing it in your peripherals, but it was like the first time looking at it and actually seeing it was blue. Oh, wow. Right. And seeing it with your own eyes rather than just like, you know, it's common knowledge. Yeah. Jesus died on the cross. And when that, here, here's what it is exactly is that Jesus died on the cross, died for your sins. And then I never connected myself to that avatar of you. Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you, right? He loves you. And for whenever I hear you, it feels like a more collective. When Jesus died for our sins, it's always, yeah, you, 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 all sometimes of Sometimes it feels together. like them. Jesus died for them sometimes. Yeah, exactly. So that's why I found out you, I was actually saying them and not me. I wasn't putting myself in the mix. I was like, oh, that's so awesome. Jesus is great. He died for all my friends' sins. <laughs> he died for all my friends' sins. He died for your sin. He died for my brother's sin. And then it was the first time I was connecting it with me. 
and just hearing again that he knows everything about me. He knows everything that I've done and still decided to lay his life. And that's what really got to me because when he, this is what really started the tears going is that during these years in Georgia, I, I, did, I failed to mention is that two times during those years, I tried to commit suicide because of how bad it was. And I just didn't, it, it just, it was a really, really dark place. Mm. And then I hear that Jesus gave his life, died, poor, and then I, I connected to what I went through just for my own selfish reasons. And then Jesus getting tortured and actually dying and going through it all, right? And then saying that he died for me. And so I, I all the trauma, everything was coming up, right? And then Jesus, and then just hearing Jesus is like, yeah, no, I still love you. Like, yeah, I know all that stuff that you went through. I still love you and I still got you. You are more than what you are labeling yourself out to be right now. You are more than your pain. I do not just label you as a pain. You aren't just all this pain that you're holding around. Sorry. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> it was all my trauma coming, being pushed to the surface. And I felt the Holy Spirit quite literally just digging it up. Like, oh, cool, piece of crap. Toss it to the side. Oh, crew, this, this has nothing to do with you. Toss it to the side. And then just all this grub just being dug out. And then just at the center, just a, that nuclear explosion of light that just started pouring out. <laughs> You're doing this Bible study with Hui and Bibi for how long? You're like, I'm a believer until uh, you got another revelation. You mean like for this night or? No, for how long you, you be Jesus is real. He died mm. for you. Did you keep on coming back to the, was we continue oh. to host these things? Yes. I've never had something like that before. And then Jesus and then, and then Hui and Bieber were like, yeah, no, we're getting called to figure out. I might be paraphr I might be paraphrasing here, but basically they were going to start shopping churches to be a part of. And so they went to different churches in the area and they said, and they were like, we're going to keep you in a loop because you should come. And I'm like, okay. And they went through different churches and eventually they found PVC. They pl found Pleasant Valley Church and then invited me to it and said, you got to come check this out. And I came and uh, not soon after Love Reality Wave 1 came through. Did you, uh, did you like the church at first? What was it about that church that was just a blessing to you? It challenged me. <laughs> it challenged me in a way where I was not comfortable with everyone else's comfortableness, where it was... Like the smiles didn't seem like the fake church smiles you sometimes get where it's just, hi, yeah, no, it's good to see you. Like that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, like yeah. there were people who were pulling me and learning about me and ask me how I was and then and then get like listening to what I'm saying and and I'm hearing what they're saying. And it's not there's more talk about how would you say not so much to the old testament. You know what I'm saying? Like mm. so much, it's like what to do with the Old Testament in terms of the New Testament mm. and how they relate to each other. There's a lot more of that talk. Whereas all I've ever known before the Bible study, before PVC, where these other places I've gone to was, I don't know, I felt like I've been, I feel like I've been stuck in Exodus for like <laughs> my whole life, right. <laughs> honestly. So you were enjoying that, but also it just feels kind of weird when so many people like are taking interest in you. Yeah, I had a panic attack where I had to go out to the parking lot and leave for a hot minute and just cry outside. And then that's when Dante, our old, their old roommate, came out and was like helping me through that. And some other people from church has talked me through it. But I had, a, I genuinely had a panic attack where everyone was, it was, oh, it was when they were washing, it was time to, we're doing, they were washing everyone's Football feet. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You can tell by my words. I didn't it's grow called up. The ordinance, <laughs> in our church, we call it the ordinance of humility. Gotcha. Yes. No, that's <laughs> so we were doing that in communion. And I was looking at it, like, everyone. It was so peaceful and quite like quite literally so heavenly and, and oh, wow. people were connecting and, and enjoying each other's company. And I was like, I can't handle this. And I <laughs> ran out and I cried in the parking lot. Why is everyone so happy? <laughs> Why is everyone <laughs> so happy and touching each other and like all this stuff? And because, and then, anyways, it was just unresolved trauma coming up again. Just, yeah, do, I don't deserve this. What did, what do you have to do to get this? I didn't do anything other than just walk through the door. Uh, hmm. And so here I was, bawling my eyes out in the street. What do you remember about Jonathan coming through with Love Reality? <laughs> <laughs> this is, this was. <laughs> Yeah, so Hui and Bibi know my story, right? And we had a community. And now that was in, in relation to this 
Bible study that they started in our hip and our like dance scene that we started coming through the PVC. And so love reality comes through and starts speaking specifically on identity and, and worth. Right. And I realized that I've just always been hearing stories. And again, I, this is the first time that I'm connecting myself to the gospel and like seeing what my place is in it rather than just a story where I aren't picturing people from like a safe distance as like a watcher. There's a specific moment where Jonathan asked everyone to come up to the stage and Hui and BB are always like, egging me on. Like, you should go up there. All right, I'll go, I'll go up there. I go up there and I'm at the side of the stage. I'm in the video. I have like friends here who are going through, there's a Bible study out here who's going through wave one. And I'm like, Josh, you're in the, you're up there, Josh. They're like seeing me and something. But yeah, that was me. But that specific moment. I love seeing you in that video. <laughs> I'm like, oh, there he is. And you look big. And then when I saw you in person in the, even the same room that you're in the video, I'm like, oh, he's way bigger than I, you know, just, but I love seeing yeah. him in that video. <laughs> yeah. So the, there's a moment, I don't know if it happened in that video, but there is, it was one of the nights because I went to multiple nights where Jonathan is, he's, he just starts, speaking out to the crowd and like prophesying like to people, like saying things about people. He me I remember one time he told Hui start going through stuff and then Jonathan pointed at Hui and said, God is your like God is CEO. You aren't and and so he's Jonathan said something to me had like very much to do with my specific past and I, my identity that it felt it wasn't like a broad statement. It wasn't a generalized statement. It's even it's hard for me to remember what it is now. I just remember when he said it that I felt a, a mix of like positivity happiness and also offended and attacked and uh <laughs> just kind of exposed and i don't know if it's in that video but I, it ha what happened was i turned around to like like i'm gonna go sit down like i'm not gonna stand up here right now i turned around and i had nowhere to go because there was like a sea of people behind me just a crowd of people behind me that and i had nowhere to go and all their hands are out like this like this mm -hmm. and they're all and i'm like all right i, I guess i'm staying here and i'm taking it <laughs> i'm standing here and taking what, what, it and, and so what was the offensive thing do you remember the offensive thing about it i remember how i felt yeah i remember how i felt because it felt so it's what it felt was that i don't i didn't keep a journal i didn't i don't have a diary or a journal or nothing like that right but it felt like before jonathan started doing that someone gave him my personal diary and then read and went to the section that was labeled what is bothering Joshua <laughs> the most deeply right now. And then instead of going, like, Hey, is it okay if I can say this out here? Do you mind if I like bring it up? And like, he's like, okay, cool. And just immediately said it. And, and then he does this thing where he's like saying with authority and he points right at you. Yeah. Right. So there's no confusion. Who is it for? Right. Just in right. case you, he put a hand out and this is for the crowd. He points and goes, no, this is for you. Like you specifically, this is you. So that felt very exposing and I was not ready for that at all because I I've only talked about certain stuff behind closed doors. And so here it was a uh, grown man I've never met before pointing at me, telling me this is the gospel meant for you and whether I was ready for it or not. Okay. We're going to take a quick break from the episode. I'm going to bring on my sister, Becca, Becca, quick question for you. How long have you been, uh, rolling with the gospel. How long do you think it's been? I've been connected with Love Reality for about four years. Four years? And what has the gospel done in changing your life, would you say? Oh, so much. Um, just so much freedom. I used to be really perfectionistic, um, just a lot of pride and worry and anxiety about what people thought of me. And I'm free from all of that now. And I'm so thankful. Okay, so uh, a little bit of change then. Praise the Lord. Mercy. Uh, you have dedicated time, money, energy so that this message gets out there. Why is this message getting out there so important to you? I mean, it's changed my life. So, and I've seen so many other lives changed by it. Um, I just want to do anything I can to help further the message and um, yeah, I'm passionate about seeing transformation in other people's lives. And this, um, this ministry does that, brings, brings the Holy Spirit to people who need it. Praise the Lord. If you are listening and you want to partner with us, you can go to lovereality.org slash give. 
That's lovereality.org slash give. And every dollar that you give goes towards this message that we are free from and dead to sin in Christ Jesus out to the world, whether that be through the podcast or internet church or one of the Bible studies. Um, it goes towards that. So please partner with us, lovereality.org slash give. And we're committed to getting this message out to the world. Thank you so much for uh, joining, Becca. Yeah, thank you. So by the end of that week, what were some things that were starting to be settled that were true about you? Who, Before I asked you who was God, God wasn't even a part of it. And then you're finding out that God is like Jesus, Jesus is like God, he is real. Who was God becoming by the end of this week that you're hearing Jonathan preach these messages? God went from an all-knowing, omniscient figure, creator of the universe, it went from all of that to God is a loving father who actually cares about me mm-hmm. and is looking out for me. God felt more personal and he felt closer. Did you start to understand like freedom from sin or like that idea that you had actually been set free from like this cosmic power or did that take some time after that week? It hit me quick. So the following week, <laughs> <laughs> the following time after that was full of tears and waterfalls and confessions. And I got sped run to baptism after that. Were you there the night that Michael Shannon was baptized? Yes, I was. Yes, I was. What did you think about all of that? How perfect it was. I felt the Holy Spirit kicking in and going, you need to go talk to this brother because you have some things to say. And recognizing again, just the stuff, what it means to deal with this trauma and what you're expected to be as a man in inside and outside of the church. I was fresh off the connection of the loving father of a God. And I wanted to just tell him like, yo, there are arms wide open at the end of the tunnel with this. Like they are, there is an embrace. There is a loving father who is with you here right now. And you have brothers here right next to you who is trying to encourage you. I went from crying on the sidewalk and crying alone to seeing people crying alone in other rooms and then knowing what that's like. Mm -hmm. And just wishing someone came into the room to hug me or at least tell me it was okay. Or at Mm -hmm. least teach me how to process that. And so whenever I see someone in this specific moment, yeah, when Michael, we call him Anthony. Uh, because yeah, he was telling me about all of his different names yeah. when I met him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah the, I recognized it. You just, when you've been there a lot, you just, you see it building up and you're like, oh, like the familiar like throws. And I, I wanted someone myself to pick me up and tell me it's all right. So I was like, I just, yeah, we noticed it too. And we're like, we gotta go talk to this brother right now. Cause this is, we can either just let this go by or we can get urged to and follow the Holy Spirit and tell him what the truth is. Everything was perfect after that, too, because it was as soon as we did that, the Holy Spirit was like, hey, come and check on this guy and I'll take care of the rest. Hmm. So since that week, you said the next week you were crying, just more stuff downloading about who you are in Christ. That was a while yeah. ago, right? That was coming up this fall five, five years ago. It was yeah. fall of 2019. Was that wave one? Yeah, because... Okay, it might have been 2019 then. Oh, yeah. no, Wave wave 2 was two th- 2019. That might have been the, okay. the earlier. Um, yeah, it was the one before that is when all that started happening with me. So coming up six years ago, yep. you've been growing in Christ ever since then. And with any kind of growth, there's pain, there's growing pains, there's speed bumps, there's learning, there's growing, there's pruning. What has God overall since that time been just showing you and teaching you even in the mistakes or even in the growth? The biggest one is, I've only mentioned this to a few close people of mine, and now I'm talking to you about it on the podcast. So I haven't actually told, I haven't even told some of my family members about this yet. Very early on, very early on, God has been calling me to come pastor and I've been running away from it. Hui and BB knew it pretty early on because the whole realization and calling happened in their apartment. <laughs> and I came out telling them exactly what just happened. But this actually is a culmination of this past six years to this past month where I've actually 
decided to listen. Hmm. So, um, <laughs> was not prepared to share that either, but here we are. Uh, I am planning to, uh, figure that out. <laughs> it's so a lot more reading of the Bible. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to go back to college for it, or I'm, I'm actually have a list of people I need to talk to first before, uh, before actually executing it. But that's where I've been is just listening to the Holy spirit entirely rather than just nitpicking. I like, I can do this. I can't do this. Where God's been calling me to pastor. And I'm like, I don't think I'm ready for that. I'm scared. Or I, I would come up with any excuses, right? He's like, okay, fine. Can you, you still can go pray for this person. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll go, I'll show up at this potluck and eat this food and talk with these people and do this kind of stuff. And these little things that were like much more low risk. But yeah, God is giving me confidence and pushing me towards this calling. Yeah. You and I have worked with each other throughout the last couple of years and behind the scenes, I've always seen your heart for people. And a pastor, there's evangelists, there's leaders. A pastor is someone who's with the people, who's taking them and guiding them. And I've seen that side of you because I just know how you care about people and that you're a good communicator. So man, that to see what God's going to do, that's exciting. I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, I think that's not a reason to not do it. I think it's the yeah. people who are like, I want to do it. I think he told me that you're like, mm, I don't know if he did. Like you get a little nervous when people just, it seems like th that thing is completing them rather than they're just following the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I've just been whispering this in like close friends' ears and like, hey, I, I'm dealing with this right now because God, and I don't know what to do. But now that I've said it out loud on a podcast, it feels like I'm locking it in. Man, you're going to listen to the Holy Spirit and you're going to move in that. And if you're not going to be a pastor, that's not going to change how you pour into yeah. people and how you love people. It might just be something you're doing in a, in a different role. Man, I'm excited to see what he does. But let me ask you this as we as we wrap this thing up is hearing how Jesus has changed your life. Like you get to jump in the DeLorean and you're going back to a little, I don't know, is it south of the ATL? Like how far south of Georgia or Atlanta? We're talking, we're talking like the Leesburg, Georgia is on the left bottom left corner. So in between, right on the corner between Alabama and Florida, not directly on it, but in that region. Okay. That's, that's real country down there. That's we're so in real. deep South. Our, that, our downtown was a railroad track and a barbershop with a gas station. You get to go back there and you get to see this kid who's just taking it all. And he seems like he's a tough guy, but it's really affecting him in a huge way. Right. Yeah. And you get to pour into this kid. What do you say to him? What do you put, put your arm around him? What would you tell him? Man. Uh, it would, there's so many lies that were being believed there just because they were so repetitive and I felt weak over time, just trying to defend against them and all these insults and all this hurt and all this pain. And I feel almost it would be too much shallow, too shallow to just say it's going to be better over time because I feel even that would have connected with me. But if I said maybe along the lines of the pain and the hurt and the suffering that it was okay to feel it mm. and stop trying to fight it and learn how to process it because there is strength in, in learning how to deal with it and then coming out. Okay. But to not lean on my own understanding and not to believe in the lies and know that the truth is that I have already been chosen. I've already been saved. I've already been loved and that God is with me even when I feel like he isn't mm. and that he loves me and that and I just said it was cliche, but it is going to be okay. Even if I don't feel it at that time. And I wish somebody would also, maybe if there were like no words spoken, sometimes just a hug would have probably been sufficient enough. Yeah, the power of just being present with somebody. Yeah. Man, your story is a blessing to me. Oh, I know we talked about it a little bit in during the episode, but we recorded this before. And I don't re remember why we said we're going to do it again, but hearing it back then and hearing it now, both times have been a blessing and seeing the way you're moving and you're going after it, 
you're a blessing to me, man. Thank you so much for sharing your story and, uh, you know, the vulnerability that it takes. You took that on and man, thank you. You're a blessing to me. No, thank you. Because like we, like you mentioned, this is our second time. Yeah. And I've always been insecure about my testimony and messing it up the first time. I was really focused on, I know the hardest point to hit is going to be the suicide and the what's happening, like suicide attempts in the Georgia story. And then I focused so hard on that. When I got to it, I just started bawling. I was not ready. And you allowed me to step back and then also came through to PVC and did a little testimony about yourself and taught us like how, like the, went through a little practice, which also strengthened my will at this moment to give it another shot and get better at sharing and speaking it and just like hopefully refining it into somewhat comprehensible levels of understanding. So no, this is this, I want to thank you for creating the space and then giving it another go with me. No, absolutely. It was a blessing to me back then. You, if you remember, you're the one who called me and said, I don't know, bro. But I was like, okay, dude, but you blessed me back then. And like I said, when I was about to go up to preach, I saw you. I'd never seen you before. And I kept leaning forward. I was trying to get your attention. But you were <laughs> locked into Kessie Rain or whoever was speaking at the time. Um, and I just see your heart, man. I just see your heart. And uh, you're a blessing to many. And this thing's going to go out and people will be blessed by hearing your story. Uh, and Jesus, Jesus is real. The sky is blue. And um, <laughs> yeah, none of that's changing anytime soon, right? Mm. yeah rich sorry i'm just <laughs> you're 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 amazing and i jesus is real and i i hope that i hope that i get to see you again soon brother because i was i was laughing at the moment you said you're trying to lean in yeah <laughs> and, and, and i was totally locked in and i was i was uh, i was in i was in love with the fact that you're about to walk up and talk and i was preparing myself i was like here we go rich is about to speak <laughs> He's about to speak and we go, we gonna be, we gonna be lit. Yeah, it yeah. was so much fun. All right, brother, we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, man, no problem. Man, in, in hearing Josh's heart and seeing what he has gone through, uh, if you're feeling the, uh, the effects of trauma in your past that bring up these emotions, then this prayer is for you, Father. Uh, I feel pain and hurt from things that have happened in the past, but while I feel them, I know that you have made me whole, that you have healed me by the stripes of Jesus Christ, that by the whipping that he took, that I am now healed because of that, that he has felt everything that I have ever felt, that he's experienced everything that I've ever experienced, and yet he has made me whole in his body. And so I thank you for that. I believe it, and I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to invite you to the Death to Life Bible Study. The Death to Life Bible Study happens every Monday night at 8 o'clock Central. Uh, it is me and my bro, Elias, and uh, we just we just talk gospel for about an hour, and then we do a little after party. Uh, so text DEATH TO LIFE to 808-204-4372. That's DEATH TO LIFE, and text it to 808-204-4372. We'll send you a link. And it will be on and popping. Uh, love y'all. Appreciate y'all. Bye.